Well, folks, my uh, message, also keeping in our mind the background of what we call the Remembrance Day, um, my message is entitled, the theme being Feeding on Manna, God's Word, and my message is, Lord, please act, it is time. Actually, this is the cry that comes out from the passage we are about to embark on, and isn't it the cry of many, when will this pandemic get over? You know, we are looking at the lives of our loved ones, and we're saying, God, touch them, touch them. Uh, we see so many things happening all over the world, besides the pandemic. We see the carelessness of how people are wasting their lives in, in a way that is just shameful. And also we are seeing that there are a lot of people who have just given up. Some have even begun to question their faith if God is there because of the troubles that we are facing. And the psalmist was in no different way when he says, Lord, please act in his time. So I don't know about you, but when we feel we are surrounded by watchful and vengeful eyes, when we see circumstances just looming over the horizon, uh, we tend to be a little impatient and you'll begin to show out uh, in our interactions. And sometimes for us believers, even in our prayers, the psalmist was no different. Just because he knew the maker of heaven and earth, he still lived on planet earth, the domain of the prince of the air, Satan himself, and he struggled. And that's why I get quite leery when I hear uh, people say, well, when you become a Christian, oh, you'll have no fear, no struggles, whatever. As long as you are in this body of flesh, you are going to have struggles. But your struggles will be different because in whom you put your faith. You know, it's amazing. At times we want to tell God to help us and if he would just move faster. Now, when you are in pain, in severe pain, believe me, God understands that prayer. When you are facing just a great uh, issue, problems, God understands those prayers. The psalmist wants God to show some action because of what's happening all around him. And how much you and I also, with what's happening around us today, is in it we're saying, oh God, please, please just intervene, just step in. You know, whether it's a, a life of a loved one, uh, whether it is illness, sickness, and uh, financial situations, um, marriage situations, as we know that through this pandemic, there's been a lot of stress on marriages uh, because of the fear one has over their children, their livelihood, and all that. So we see the psalmist is living in the real world. He's facing real issues. But then I appreciate what the psalmist does. He turns in a real way to look to God because he knows the answer will come from God. So let's take a short walk with the psalmist and see what we can learn from his day and what we can learn from our day through God's word. First, I want you to see the psalmist, his serious concern. There are four areas I want to touch today. First, we see the psalmist's serious concern. Verses 121 to 124. And then we want to look at his sweet captivity. In midst of trials and difficulty, we see his sweet captivity. And then we want to see from verses 126, his sole complaint. Oh yes, the psalmist also complained. And you know what? People said, well, we can go to God and complain. I'll tell you, God is a lot bigger. 
he can handle all our pain, all our sorrow, all our complaint. Look at the life of Job. Fourthly, his significant claim. And that is so important for us today to work through. First, we look at his serious concern. Taken from Psalms 121 to 124, he wanted God to act. Where? In government. So first he wanted God to act in government. How much more we would like our government to act in so many crucial areas that our nation is facing. Yes, we want the government to act even in some areas which concerns morality. You know, we want government to act in the area of abortion. So here you see the psalmist, he says, I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. You see, this is like the Lord's Prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here we have a seemingly endless problem of right forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Is the endless problem of the suffering of the godly. Remember Job? How this man suffered. You see the short term view, the problem has no answer. In the long run, we will be well because what? God is not dead. He is not asleep. His silence is not the silence of indifference, but the silence of infinite patience. The psalmist has done what is right. But where is the action from God? This fits right in with Job's dilemma. This man was righteous. The Bible calls him righteous. Man. And yet, look what he suffered. You see, it seems it's at a point where many lose their faith. Even through this time of pandemic, some people have just parked their faith. You see, the psalmist retains a sense of proportion, which is so amazing. Losing faith in God only leads to a greater despair. The psalmist simply did one thing. He dug in. The triumph of the wicked is only temporary, people. He wanted God to act in government. You see, when we are at the mercy of an unscrupulous person, we know what that can feel like. So the psalmist says, I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. You know, when our country went to war, they were trying to stem the evil that was parading itself all over. Men and women lost their lives because they believed in what is right and good and proper. And there was a price for that. The psalmist understands that. So what does the psalmist choose to do? I have done what is just and right. But then he turns to God. He said, do not leave me to my oppressors. And yes, there's a day coming when the hand of the oppressor will be lifted from us. But until that day, like the psalmist, we are called to do what is just and right. He also wanted God to act not only in government, but as his guarantor. He wanted God to be the one that gives him the guarantee that all will be well. Listen to how he brings the word of God to your heart, to my heart, and how he talks to God. Psalms one, uh, 119 verses 122, verses 122. He says, give your servant a pledge of good, let not the insolent oppress me. You see, this is the only verse in this psalm which does not employ one of the synonyms of God's word. There is a reason. Throughout this psalm, the psalmist is like a man who has written, who has a written guarantee to secure him in case of need. The guarantee was God's written word. Again and again you see him appealing to God's promises, God's word, God's truth, God's law, God's statutes. Here, you find the psalmist now, not neglects the word, but puts down the word 
because he is coming to the living word. He is coming to the living word. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you know, you search the law, but the law brings you to me. And they couldn't uh, make sense of that. Yes, the word of God should lead us to Jesus Christ, the living word. And this is what the psalmist does. You see, the guarantee was God's written word. And again and again, he has fallen back on God's word. Again and again, he has gone back to the word to find encouragement from unconditional promises. It seems he has wrapped himself in these promises despite the circumstances that surrounded him. When great fear taunted him, he put his finger on the promises and said, I believe that. As much as the situation is unchanged, the guarantee reads well enough. The divine signature is legible enough, but nothing seems to have happened. So here the psalmist puts down the written word and goes directly to the living word, to the guarantor himself. He says, be surety for your servant. Be surety for thy servant. He says, give your servant a pledge of good. Now here it's very interesting to also note he knows that he did not appeal to God in vain. The whole plan of God's salvation is in focus here. And nothing delights God more than when we take him at his word unless we have come to him face to face and tell him how dependent we are on him. You see here the psalmist, he did not know God's long-term plan. And he might have that one day God will send a redeemer. But we do. You see, Jesus Christ is God's guarantee that he's coming to redeem his people. It's taken time and I'm glad that God has given us this time. Because what about your loved one that's turned their face away from God? What about your loved one that does not know God? If God came yesterday, how many would be facing eternal damnation? Now some have rejected God and there's a price to pay. But God, his infinite patience has one purpose, to draw as many to himself. So here we see in government, he has done what is just and right and he begs God not to leave him to his oppressors. In verse 122, he begs God for a pledge of good. And then he said, let not the insolent oppress me. You see, people may oppress us physically, but they can never oppress our mind and our heart because of what God has done. Jesus said, when the Son of Man sets you free, you will be free indeed. And what a joy to live in freedom of mind, heart, and spirit, knowing that that has been guaranteed to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, He is the guarantor that God has given us. He came. He died. He rose. He's gone back and He said to us, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And this is why the church must be ready. The psalmist saw the need to have a pledge of good. He needed a guarantee. He needed a guarantor that would give him that. And God has given to us through Jesus Christ our Lord.